Hi, our speaker tonight is Greg Baron Gafford. He's a professor in the School of Geography, Development and Environment at the University of Arizona, and also is the Associate Director of the Community and School Garden Program. His work has largely been based in the drylands of the world. He's worked for the last 18 years in the southwestern U.S., studying earth system science, plant ecology, and the impacts of climate and land use change. Since 2011, he's been building the field of agrivoltaics. This is the concept of co-locating agriculture and photovoltaics, um, getting our renewable energy from solar panels. His team began this work in Southern Arizona to study the benefits across the food, energy, water nexus. And over the years, they've developed a national and international program connecting with researchers in Colorado and Oregon here in this country and in Africa and the Middle East. So there's a lot going on and it's, it's I think we're gonna find it very exciting and a chance to put together this nexus of food, energy, and water. Greg, would you take it away? You want to show your face first? <laughs> there we go. I don't know if you can see me in here, oh, but yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, uh, I'll break and share first. Um, so hi, I'm Greg Baron Gafford, and I'm here Arizona, I'm outside. Um, Pre-apologies if one of the kids comes out. I went outside so that they couldn't find me as easily because um, my wife is at work tonight over at TMC. Um, it's good to finally uh, be able to speak with folks from Sustainable Tucson. I've been hearing about your, your efforts and your drive for a while now. Um, apologies to Kirsten, who's seen some of this presentation before. Um, having helped push some of this work um, up to the national stage. And so I'm glad to be able to speak to a state senator, a future congressperson, and all of my fellow Southern Arizonans. Um, so thank you. Yeah, we'll go ahead and share screen now. Can you see this okay? Yeah. Yeah, looks Great. good. So um, thanks, Paula, for the introduction. I'm I am Greg. I do work at the Biosphere in addition to the university um, campus. This is, if you haven't been there yet, this is the Biosphere in the background, um, illustrating this idea of agrivoltaics. That's really just a mashup of the word agriculture and the word photovoltaics, which is the fancy way of saying solar panels and pushing them together because it really is co-locating food and energy production in the same parcel. And I'm going to say right up from the beginning, like um, I work at the university and so we give PowerPoints a lot, but I also do not want this to feel like a lecture where you have to wait and hold your question. So if you ever have a, a thought or a question, um, feel free to spit it out. In fact, before we even get going, let's see if there's any burning questions that I should make sure and hit um, that you might have or things you may have heard about that you wonder, is that real or is that true about solar um, or this idea of agrivoltaics? And I can see if we can touch on it. For everybody else, you can also put a question in the chat, but you can ask it directly as well. Yes. <clears throat> Nothing yet? Well, hopefully oh, I, have, I have a little observation on your first photo there. Okay. It looks to me like the rows of photo of modules are very tightly packed. And in fact, they would be likely to shade each other. <laughs> yeah. In this instance, they do in the winter, um, but in the summer, they don't. And I would not design a system like this again. It's just that this one was the the first in the country and definitely the first at any kind of university that has lots of worries about risk management. Um, and so it's on a really, really hardy steel structure too. Um, I'll show you pictures in a moment about what this looks like in practice now. 
But thanks, Dwayne. Please do, even the critical questions. I mean, this is how we grow for sure. So, you know, in terms of sustainability, I mean, we all like to eat. We all want to keep being able to live here and we want sustainable agriculture, but the current practices for our food production and the changing climate that we've all been experiencing, you know, to have last year getting, you know, you know, getting 13 inches almost in the monsoon the previous year, less than one. I mean, how do farmers plan for that kind of environment when they're producing our food? And because of changes in the climate and water access, we're having a harder time producing food. In fact, if you look over in Imperial Valley, which is just west of Yuma, and you did the Google time, like Google Maps, and you kind of slid the time bar, you know what I'm talking about? In Google Earth, we can look at like in the past and current. You can actually watch the transition of food producing farms turn into solar arrays. Because as it says here in the Sacramento Bee, you know, low on water, California farmers are turning to solar farming. And, you know, we're about to have these same big water challenges here in Arizona. So how do we not lose the agrarian lifestyle of, of Arizona and that practice and that income and that livelihood for, you know, so many families? At the same time, you know, we want to move to more renewables. But I think it's important to know the whole story. And so I'm a plant ecology person, as you mentioned, and I didn't realize that solar panels are actually sensitive to temperature. So, you know, look at this map here. The darker colors represent the parts of the US that are best in terms of photovoltaic power potential, our ability to produce energy. It kind of looks like a weather map, but that's because we're so sunny. Um, and whoa, there we go. And this, this little figure is important because what we're looking at here on the y-axis, the up and down, that's the efficiency of solar panels. And on the x-axis, that flat line at the bottom, that shows different temperatures. You know, and we're scientists, so we work in Celsius. And if you're not used to that, Celsius, um, this graph would start at 25 degrees Celsius, which is about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And so think about how often is it above 77 when it's sunny here? quite a bit. And so that means a lot of times our solar panels are underperforming. Geez, now I'm stuck here. So automating, it's pushing me along. So, you know, we're thinking about sustainable Tucson. There's also sustainable development goals for the whole world that the United Nations has worked on. And we're trying to think about how do you create a sustainable future around what they call target seven, you know, things around renewable energy where we want to increase the amount of renewable energy out there. We want to make it more efficient so that it's easier um, for other places to adopt, even though we just talked about how it's sensitive to temperature. So that's a challenge already. But it's not just using our land for energy. We also want to continue um, to have universal access to safe and nutritious food, boost the efficiency of that production because we're having a growing population. And on top of that, we can't do either of these things and forsake the fact that we need clean water. Um, so how do we figure out which one of these things we value most? And in thinking about that, I came to this quote. I like this Albert Einstein quote because I, I like to <clears throat> joke that I Googled it twice, so it must be true. But this is where my inspiration for this came from. I was studying the savannas of, you know, Southern Arizona and like the Santa Rita experimental range and looking at how plants grow and, you know, plants can really exist in the shade of these nurse trees, right? You know, our saguaro even has to be there, you know, to in the early stages to get through the hot summer sun and the freezes of the winter. And so, as he says here, you know, leaking deep into nature, I started to have this aha moment of solar panels are overheating, our crops are in the sun and experiencing so much stress, what if we just brought the two together and our solar canopy was like the mesquite tree or the Palo Verde, where it was the canopy and it's not competing for water, but it can benefit from having crops underneath. We were talking to a journalist once and, and she said, oh, I get it. You're just a farm that harvests the sun twice. Of course, just sure enough, a scientist had to talk to a reporter to get the better phrasing. And we are, we're harvesting the sun in the overstory with those solar panels and in the vegetation in the understory. Yeah, it's a pretty cool way of thinking about it. 
And so as Dwayne noted, you know, our installation here in the middle, it's just densely packed solar panels. We were looking like the, the most intense solar situation. The picture on the right with the two women with the temperature guns, those are um, teachers over at Monzo Elementary on, you know, uh, St. Mary's west of I-10, another school in town where we're doing the Sagavoltaics work. And it is like the typical solar parking structures that you see around different TUSD campuses. But on the left is what this is gonna look like in most places, where you have rows of solar panels as you typically do, slightly elevated and growing vegetation in and around that spacing. And so to look at it in terms of a cartoon picture, on the left, we're looking at a situation where underneath the solar panels, we're just putting in, you know, native grasses for grazing or pollinator species. And on the right is some different examples of crops. And those little blue arrows um, are part of the system we're talking about. So we want to, you know, try to number one, adapt our food system to survive through periods of drought and temperature stress. And what I'm talking about there is, I mean, think about it, and you can't imagine now it's February, but think about in like June, right? When it's so hot and that sun's beating down on us, we hide in the shade. You know, plants don't have that option of moving. And so we're actually bringing the shade to them and creating a better microclimate for them to grow in. So being in that shade means that you're not stressed out in the middle of the day. They're not experiencing all that intense radiation and hot temperatures. And that part about improving renewable energy production, remember this graph where we showed how their function goes down with temperature? The flip side is also true. If you can cool off a solar panel, you're gonna make it more efficient. And so that's what these blue arrows are representing here. Plants actually lose water through a process called transpiration. It may not be something you remember back from biology class, but the Matt, you just know with our own skin, we perspire, we lose water and it helps cool us down. Plants lose water in their natural process of doing photosynthesis to live. And that water can actually cool down the solar panels that are overhead. So just like the misters at Rubio's, right? Only you don't see the water. So we weren't sure that it would work. So we went and tested it and found out that it does. And the last part is easing our dependence on irrigation. Just think if you spilled your water in the shade versus the sun, where would it stay wet longer? Dwayne. In the shade, right? Um, and so we're using this very simple principles. You're just, you have your camera on, so I'm gonna call on you. <laughs> um, don't turn it off. Um, and so we're using these really simple principles to try to create a, a better working system. You know, and what it means for farmers is that, you know, the situation on the right where they're producing food, you can get some food production for sure. It's gonna be harder in a changing climate. And in the far left situation, you can get energy production from a solar farm, but it might be harder in a changing climate. But some version of this co-located agrivoltaics could actually mean more revenue represented by this wider bar, in addition to more energy production, more food production, and some eye, some eye towards uh, water conservation. So let's walk through some of these other benefits. You know, because I'm an ecologist, and we think about these different services that our ecosystems do for us. You know, in a, this first one, like a natural ecosystem, we get that transpirational cooling that helps keep our climate cool. Plants are doing photosynthesis. They're scrubbing carbon out of the atmosphere for us. That's another big service. They produce biomass that, you know, is uh, there for forage for animals. They bring biodiversity. They help stabilize the water system. Um, you know, you transition to an energy system and you do, you get energy production, but we have to recognize we're giving up these other things when we make this sustainable transition. And I'm not saying that solar is bad. I'm just saying that there could be better ways of doing it than what we currently do um, oftentimes, which is clear out the vegetation and put in solar. Part of it is we just have to move past an either or idea in terms of our land use systems. So I can tell that Jana's wondering, don't plants need sunlight? You know, I remember in biology class, that's gotta be true. And so let's, let's look at a few graphs here. So here we're looking at the 
rates of photosynthesis across different light levels. And, you know, your biology teacher didn't lie to you. Plants do need sunlight. And you give them more sunlight and they do more photosynthesis, but it quickly plateaus off. And so you might be wondering, like, where are we in Tucson? Well, this is us, this bright yellow sun. So you can see that we're well beyond that saturation point. What's really cool is that this shady sun represents the level of light under a solar panel. Solar panels do cast shade because they are harvesting the sun, but they're not that much worse. In fact, a lot of times they can be better than your back porch where we intentionally grow plants, right? And so we're utilizing this knowledge that you can cut out two thirds of the sunlight, but it doesn't mean you're cutting out two thirds of the photosynthesis that a plant can do. And there's a trade off, right? So this is the photosynthesis related to temperature. Plants are like us. They don't love it too cold. They don't love it too hot. They like it somewhere in between. You know, on a typical sunny day in Tucson, we're beyond their optimal point. And so if we can create a cooler environment, we can push them closer to that optima. So it just turns into a trade-off question, which means we just have to design our solar arrays to maximize these different benefits. And humans are great engineers and trouble, trouble fixers. And so we can do that. So that's where we started to do some of this work in Southern Arizona. I didn't know if it was gonna work. And so our first installation um, was actually just one solar panel you can kind of see it off to the right in this biosphere picture. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but you see this one solar panel on the ground over here in the far right. Yeah. That's all I could afford was money for one solar panel. So I went and bought a solar panel in Southern Arizona, right? So I got the crops to make salsa in case all else failed. So I got cilantro plants that were really short, then pepper and then tomato plants. They kind of follow that plane of a solar panel and we went and tested it and we found that it did work. You know, we could cool down the solar panel with this transpirational water loss from plants, something you can't even see. And the shade from the panels did provide, you know, some sustainable production from those crops so they didn't dry out and die. I'm just gonna check the chat here. What about the problem? A question from Bruce, he might wanna ask that. Okay. What about the problem of the panels reducing the sun and warmth that plants need in winter? Ah, good question. So let me see if I can show that more clearly in a, in a figure in a second, Bruce, thanks. So here's a picture of us in not the winter. This is in summer. These are a bunch of um, our undergrads from the university up at the biosphere. Naturally, they're hanging out in the shade. We have this little machine that allows you to clamp on to a plant, just like we go to the doctor and they check your pulse and your blood pressure. This is how we check and see how well plants are doing. We, we measure their photosynthesis. And I wanna show you another few graphs. This one is photosynthesis again, but looking through the time of day. And I think this one's really interesting because plants are green all day, or in the case of cabbage, kind of purpley, but it doesn't mean they're photosynthesizing all day. In fact, if you think about it, you can kind of, kind of think about a mesquite tree. You see the leaves are flat, and sometimes in June by the middle of the day, they kind of fold up. They're hiding from the sun. That's an adaptation they have. But a lot of our crops that we grow don't have all those cool adaptations. We're not usually growing cacti. We're growing lettuce and tomatoes and other crops. And so what you can see here in this red line, this is crops where we are measuring their photosynthesis every hour. The sun came out and their photosynthesis just took off. That's them scrubbing carbon out of the atmosphere so that they can grow and live and make fruits. But then you can see that they quickly drop off. And by lunch, they're basically off for the day. The way that farmers get around this is they irrigate a second time in the afternoon. So watering multiple times a day to try to keep the plants like propped up. It's a challenge and it's not gonna be possible anymore, right? Under these water restrictions that are coming. So this is the plot of photosynthesis throughout a day under the solar. And so, in, thinking about Bruce's question, but in the summertime, yeah, you don't hit as high of a peak in the middle of the day when conditions are right, but you stay active longer. So you're really sustaining that plant function for a longer period of time. It's a classic tortoise in the hare situation. So which one is better? Well, you make undergrads measure all day and you find out. <laughs> 
well, we go out there with them, don't worry. Um, and we, you know, accumulate that carbon uptake throughout the day. And then you can start to make graphs like this, which we've been making for a bunch of different crops, where in the blue is the agrivoltaics. You can see for certain plants like chiltopene and tomato, you get a lot more carbon uptake, a lot more sustained production. And that turns into a lot more fruit production. Jalapenos were slightly less, they mostly didn't care. Um, either way is the point there. And the other point is that, you know, this varies by plants. So we have to do the science of measuring these different crops in all of our regions, because I am not going to be feeling confident telling, you know, a farmer. Oh, I'm guessing you can hear that. Yeah. Uh, ben, <laughs> is this a temperature uh, factor or something else? Uh, this is a combination of temperature and uh, the low humidity in the middle of the day, too. Uh -huh. So that low humidity also makes them shut down. So yeah. the stoma are shutting down? Wow. Good use of the word stoma. Yes, absolutely. So, <laughs> hey, stop it. So, yes, when the air is too dry, the plants close their stomates up because they don't want to lose water, which means carbon can no longer go in, so they're not doing photosynthesis. Um, and so it's, yeah, that's exactly right. And so at this point, we've measured a bunch of different crops and all of these that you see pluses are ones we've seen real benefits from. The circles are more neutral and the only negative had been broccoli until this year. We're seeing good production in broccoli as well. So we haven't found any crops that are just obviously terrible with this situation. You might be asking why not your, why not corn and cotton? Um, those are not really appropriate for this kind of system because of the aerial application of pesticides and other things that go into that production. But we're looking at other types of crops. And I know we're getting there on time. So let me just walk through energy real quick. So the gray lines here are traditional solar panels that don't have crops grown underneath them. And this is their temperature throughout a day. This is in May of last year. The blue lines are the temperature of solar panels that were in the agrivoltaic system. And you don't have to zoom in to, to see. I can just tell you that the summertime average cooling was about 9 degrees Celsius, about 17 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a lot. That's a whole lot for water vapor coming out of plants that you can't even see. And we were really surprised um, by how efficient that is. I mean, really, we just changed the microclimate underneath. And the Department of Energy is very curious what this is going to mean in terms of reducing the wear and tear on those panels that really go through some extreme conditions down here for us. But thinking back to this graphic, which is the why we did it, if we can cool these down by about nine degrees Celsius, we worked with the National Renewable Energy Lab, and that showed that during those summer months, we increased generation by about 3%. And that turns into real numbers when you start to think about larger installations. So there's enormous potential here from both farmers and energy production. But especially lately, I've been worried about our water situation. And so, you know, we have instruments measuring all of these different things in our systems because we're science types. Let me just sit here, there, block the light. Um, so what we're looking at here is pulses of soil moisture. We have little sensors in the ground. So every increase here is because we irrigated you know, and then it dries out, irrigated and dries out. And again, the blue line is agrivoltaic. So you can see that, you know, we changed the microclimate. Sorry, there's a fly. We changed that microclimate under the solar panels. So the water is lasting longer. That's the ODA I was joking with Dwayne about. Like, yeah, it's going to be longer in the shade. But how much longer? Well, you can see here that right before that next irrigation event in the agrivoltaics drop down to this point, which the control site, traditional farming hit in about two to three hours. So the irrigation event was supporting food production for two days instead of two to three hours. Dogs. So that's significant. And it really makes us wonder about, you know, can some of our marginal lands in Arizona now be food producing places? Thinking about Leah. Sorry. Um, can these arable lands now, like, you know, thinking about a lot of our indigenous communities who are on lands that don't have very good 
food security, but they've historically not been able to produce much energy. Can some of these places now produce food because we've taken off some of that, that harsh edge of our environment? And more importantly, in a lot of the other places can we reduce our irrigation use. And so a lot of this was summarized in this scientific paper um, and I'm be glad to share a PDF, but we also have made little videos about it too. Um, and I've got a website at the end I can point you to. I just want to share and end with a few things like people ask us, okay, you've, you've shown it in your extreme environment of Southern Arizona, but what about other places? And this graphic shows the pumpkin symbol. A guy in Colorado made this, that's why it's pumpkins. Um, all the pumpkins show places around the country where we're working on testing agrivoltaics with different crops. And the green one is where we're also testing pollinator habitat or other kind of ecosystem services around doing a more sustainable approach to solar. And just recently we got um, some funds from the USDA to add an additional site in Colorado and Illinois so we can really stretch what we've learned down here to some other types of growing environments because they do their food production really differently there. I think I'll skip past some of this so we can move to some real questions, but you know, agrivoltaics can look like different things in different places. In some places, it looks like grazing sheep underneath to keep weeds down instead of mowing. In some places, it looks like being a better neighbor to your farmers who are still in farming by growing native uh, species that attract pollinators and help sustain pollinator populations for those crops. In some places, it means increasing the height of those solar arrays. And now they even have solar arrays that stay vertical so that you're not having trouble with wind load and you're better capturing sunlight, kind of like a jojoba leaf, if you know jojoba. It's capturing that morning, that really intense light in the morning and the afternoon. But if you look from overhead, you're not seeing a lot of solar in the middle of the day, which is one way of dealing with intense light on something that can't handle being hot, like jojoba or a solar panel. So this is looking like a lot of different ways. Um, you know, this started off 10 years ago with a few random ideas about things that were questionable. And now we've got a six acre site up in uh, Longmont, Colorado. We're about to break ground on an additional acre at the biosphere, um, demonstrating more dryland agriculture under solar. And in the next year, we're also going to be building out a couple of acres out at a campus ag center near Red Rocks. So moving around the state and trying to show different populations what this can look like. Because people have a lot of questions until you can show them what an example of it might be. This is from our Colorado site. You can see we're just growing right in between those rows of panels, harvesting a lot of produce, more than we anticipated. Um, we ended up harvesting 8,000 pounds of produce from an acre in Colorado. And, you know, people ask, well, how much is that relative to other? Um, it's, well, we've had a lot of caveats because we had to start later in the season. But more importantly than anything for me is that's 8,000 pounds of produce we produced that wasn't going to happen if they just switched to solar. And that's really underscoring that message of we can do both. And if you elevate the panels tall enough, um, people who are 6'3", like me, don't hit their heads on the solar panels. Um, I'll just stop there. I want to end with, well, actually, since Bruce asked this, we've been working with Monzo Elementary and these other schools to really get kids engaged in the work that we're doing. Um, kids are awesome at problem solvers. They're really good at asking really hard questions. Is that sci-fi movie ever or second favorite? <laughs> um, Let's see, and this, this goes straight to Bruce's question. So what about in the winter when plants could use the warmth or they could use more light? So we are doing this also over at Rincon and University High. And so high schoolers are asking different questions than the Monzo kids in fourth grade. They were saying, if, okay, if you've changed the climate, maybe you can actually change the growing season. And so on the left are carrot seeds that were planted in late August. And if you've done any gardening here, we plant carrots in like uh, November, late October, November. So they planted seeds in both places, the open sun and under the little agrivoltaic installation at Rincon University. And you know, they kept planting them every week. So this picture is from uh, 
mid-September and you're starting to see pretty good germination of all the carrots and the seeds out in the sun are still just dying for science in the agrival or in the open sun. But look, by the time we're in the first week of November, you've got germination in the open sun like you should, and it's harvest time in the agrival ticks. And so here's a picture of our teacher growing, picking one of those carrots. This is Barbara Hurley over there. So it actually kind of helped create a warm blanket, which was really shown up here at Monzo. This is a Monzo site. You know, this viney looking thing is sweet potatoes. Um, this is year before last. Um, and light can still penetrate because uh, in the winter, the sun comes in at such a lower angle that light can still penetrate deep underneath the solar array. But at night, when there is no sun and all of the energy we got during the day radiates back to the sky, just like on cloudy nights, it doesn't cool off as much. And on the clear nights, we get the freezes. Solar panels kind of act like cloudy nights. They keep that diffuse energy trapped there. And so in the agrivoltaics, nothing froze. But in the open sun, we lost all of those crops. And so it's actually extending the growing season for us. And here's some kids. You can see one, one basil plant in the front. They're kneeling down. That's about three feet tall. The one in our solar installation ended up being over six feet tall. And when we harvested it, we made nine gallons of pesto with the kids. So I'm just gonna stop there. And um, since we do have representatives, I wanna note that, well, maybe I will share one more screen, if you'll let me. Absolutely. Um, I think that we're, we're really been seeing how the public is ready for a solution. Anytime we present on this, we get some really good press coverage because it's kind of an out of the box idea that actually works. And we try to stress with the kids that, you know, you solve problems all the time. You're engineers, you're scientists. What we're doing is just a slightly upscaled version of it. We need your creativity to solve these problems. And in other places around the country, you know, policy change is coming in terms of incentives. And so in Minnesota, they actually put out something called a pollinator friendly scorecard. So if you want to deploy solar in that state, and they also have it in Maryland, you get different points. So look at this question, the percent of your facility that we planted or seeded with native plants. And imagine if we gave people um, more likelihood to be able to get your projects built or incentivized than planting out with native plants, mix of flowering plants, you know, did things that were in line with the conservation service, supported pollinators, um, reduced water and energy impacts. There's some real, real cheap ways of incentivizing people to make the right decision, or at least what some of us here tonight might think is the right decision. Um, and so I just hope that we can keep uh, calling our representatives, um, those who don't join these calls, and push for better solutions for Southern Arizona. That's a terrific <laughs> idea. Um, well, thanks, Greg. This is, it's, it's really exciting and it's really fascinating and, and <laughs> very promising. Um, Nika, I'm not sure if it's Nika or Nika, mm -hmm. uh, asked a question that was also on my list. Is this something that is beneficial to do on a small scale, like in our own backyards with small gardens or in neighborhoods? And I saw Bruce was asking about community gardens as well. Yes, absolutely. I'm just turning up my brightness because it's gotten dark. Um, absolutely. And I think the reason I can say that so confidently is that I started off with just one solar panel. And with the ASU um, up north, we recently got a program for doing research experience with teachers. And one of the things that we're doing is creating basically little raised container, you know, like the cattle trough type gardens with solar panels mounted overhead to provide shade, that then you could use that energy for, you know, doing things like driving the irrigation system or something if you were in a completely off-grid um, installation. but. Absolutely, the impacts can be felt on the single panel scale. It sounds like a wonderful entree also for a community solar, a community garden, community solar that, that helps the whole neighborhood. 
uh, these are concepts that we need to work on through the uh, Corporation Commission and maybe the legislature. Um, and I think that that's a wonderfully promising uh, notion. I said that would be a great combination. Absolutely. Um, that's a good one. Thanks, Dwayne. I, I would really love to come back and hear what Sustainable Tucson or any of you know about potential for um, community solar and community gardens co-connecting in southern Arizona and different places. The, the Department of Energy is increasingly interested in this idea of co-location and using these untapped spaces um, for bringing renewables because truth is they don't want renewables out in the middle of nowhere. It costs a lot to bring all that energy back. That's part of why we're seeing this land use conflict between farmers and energy is farmers are right around the urban center, right? Because they were used to be out in nowhere um, as the city's grown to them. And we can't cover all of our needs with rooftop solar. We're pushing just outside of the solar or just outside of the city boundaries. And that's where the farms are. Let's see, um, Cindy asked, can panels be used for water harvesting? Wow, y'all are like right there on the cutting edge with us. So absolutely. Um, it's really interesting because we have to think about how, when we get that rain. And so part of what we had done when we started to use the tracking panels is when we would get our afternoon monsoon storms, the water was oftentimes being directed onto the west side of our rows because the solar panels were facing west when the fronts would come through. And absolutely, you can certainly use the, we've been talking about watershed management group. If we could talk about how to set up berms on those, on those different sides of the solar panels as a way of collecting the water intentionally and doing it the right way. And that would be I... different water, different ways to irrigate with the water that comes off of the panels. So another way of saving on irrigation. Yes, absolutely. I think the, the, uh, the notion of these single axis trackers that would go basically east to west during the day uh, opens up a lot of possibilities too. If it, if it gets to the point where agrivoltaics uh, scales up to be like at a utility scale or a large, large farm, mm -hmm. uh, I could very much foresee uh, getting to the point where it would be advantageous at certain times when we're not using air conditioning, say April and May, the sun is shining a lot, uh, that actually it may be beneficial both to the energy system and to the agricultural uh, practice for those panels not to point directly to the sun, but at those times when it's not as quite as hot yet, let the plants get the sun because the, uh, the grid actually can't take that much energy at the time. So you could have that control be, uh, again, mutually beneficial. Yes, dang Dwayne. So I need to get you on some review panels with the Department <laughs> of Energy because Kirsten and I put together a proposal a few years ago. And one of the things we talked about was being much more intentional with that tracking algorithm, they call it for the solar panel. So if I was telling you that plants need most of their energy in the morning, you know, when the conditions are better and people at TEP and the grid say, well, those morning hours are the worst for onboarding renewable energy because you're so intermittent, it's not really helping. And so I was saying, well, if this is, if my lights in the backyard are the sun, I don't know how I can do it. Is just let the sunlight through in the morning and then take over tracking. You know, really be smart about how you're sharing the solar resource. So you're right there on the cutting edge of what we're trying to put in proposals to convince what we should try. So thanks. I really think there's a, a great opportunity in the urban area uh, to apply this in a joint uh, situation, situation where you're producing power and food and water and also since it's in the urban area you've got the potential for a, a, an emergency power supply hmm. that can go to things like water pumping in case there is a major power outage so there's some real possibilities to uh, do this sort of thing on a distributed basis all over Tucson. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and if I can just jump in here on uh, Friday, we had a presentation from Courtney Croson. Greg, do you know her? I do. In the Drachman Institute. Well, she works on community gardens hmm. and her research is about how community gardens really address issues of nutrition. And there's so much better de dealing with issues of sort of food deserts um, in yeah. urban areas. Hmm. And uh, so the nutritional angle seems to me to be another thing that maybe this isn't just Department of Energy, maybe USDA or something can get yes. okay. into this, as well as you know, generating the electricity to pump the water and things like that, because these community gardens are usually on public land. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need a source of water, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway. Um, I wanted to follow up on what you were saying and showing us with Monzo. We went there a few years ago and had a wonderful presentation by a couple of the uh, students. Um, and one of the things they showed us were they, they're looking differentially at plants growing grown under and plants grown at the edges of the mm -hmm. home where, they're, where they sort of go back and forth. Can you talk about the impact and the, and the different effects and, and maybe differences in what crops work for each of those? Yes, absolutely. So, wow, I, I had no idea you'd been there. So that was cool. You might've come in the winter time then. Um, no, actually, I think it was summer, but okay. yeah. Um, yeah, so the ones who are, well, yeah, so we do plants, plants out in the full sun and it is science. And we talk about like how they're doing really experimental research. So, so let's say if we have five rows, row one out in the full sun and row one under the solar panels are planted at the same thing. And row two is the same in both. So it's a complete science fair project um, that we're doing here. And the ones down on the closer to the edge, especially in the winter, get a lot more of that sunlight penetrating through because of the lower angle, as opposed to deeper in the shade. And we've actually used that that finding from the kids over at Monzo, and we put, you know, Mr. Stoner's class, um, because it was his class that put little popsicle sticks and measured every week how far the sun was migrating in, and this, they could really, I mean, think about it, they're kids who are in fourth grade, and they're making this connection with seasonality and how my crops are bigger or less big because of how deep they are in the shade. I was blown away, and we showed that to the Department of Energy to show just how much we still need to study. We can't just say, oh, this works or, oh, this doesn't work. There are all these nuances about how much sunlight you get, you know, on a daily basis. So right now in the winter, you know, we had a few freezes in the last few weeks. And you know, the plant Chiltepine, it makes these really small, like fingernail sized peppers, pretty spicy. And I embarrassed myself by eating one while being interviewed by Arizona Public Media last week. So, We'll see if they cut that part out, but they yeah. said, I bet it's not even spicy because it's grown in the shade and I proved them wrong, but then paid for it. But <laughs> out on the edge, because there's less of that, you know, heat blanket of the solar panels, those chiltepine plants look like the ones out in the open, like they're, they're leafless. They, they don't look good because it's not their time of year, but the plants that are deeper under the solar still look like they're in the middle of the summer. You know, they've got nice, rich green leaves. They've got green peppers and red peppers on them. And so there is variation within an installation. And so that's the other part is we're trying to track, you know, what, what are those benefits? <clears throat> and how we'll use that information is when we design solar sites, either our community garden sites, we can think about the spacing and how much light we want to let through. We now know that too much light because of that dense solar that they have at some of the schoolyards is too much sunlight. We would not repeat that design intentionally at a community garden because we've learned that lesson with the kids. Yes. And we try to stress that to the kids. Like, look, the adults are making decisions based on what we're doing here. It's fantastic. And they were just, they were both enthusiastic and, and incredibly good speakers um, for this group of adults that came to see it. Um, 
Good, I'm glad to hear it. I, you showed us that map of all of the different parts around the US. Um, where yeah. else outside of the US are you working or are people working on this kind of research? Yeah, the, there's, real, real, there's real big pushes in Germany and France. Part of the reason there is, you know, they're constrained by space. You know, people have lived in every part of all of those places. Um, and if you want to add more renewable energy, you have to give something else up. And so they're really struggling with, you know, how much land do they give up for renewable energy? Oh, it says my internet is unstable. <laughs> We can it's still hear you. Yeah. Did I lose you? No, no, no we're you're fine. fine. We can hear you. You sometimes back on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can you hear us? Okay. Um. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Um. Similarly, in Japan, um, they're having this issue. You know, they they're they're space constrained, and so it's big there. Um, thanks, Jana. And but otherwise, uh, the university has tight connections with projects in Mexico City, so we're building a new installation down there this year. We have an installation in the Arava Desert um, of Israel. And we last year built a project out in about an hour south of Nairobi in Kenya. And this uh, last month, we just commissioned a site in Tanzania. And I, I really do, I try to stress, stress to the university students and these Monzo kids and the Rincon kids that, you know, this is blowing up over the country. And when we show these graphs, we're showing pictures of your work and our work. And other places are, they're kind of leapfrogging us, right? They, they have food and energy and water challenges on the horizon. and they're not doing solar the way we did. They're not transforming and giving up food production for energy production. They're thinking about ways to co-locate. And I just hope that, um, that we can think more broadly, whether it's agrivoltaics or something else, some other sustainable solution that will keep thinking broadly about what kind of possibilities are out there. Just because we did something before doesn't mean it's the best way to keep doing it. I have a question, Greg. Um, how does this relate? Is there any potential to combine this with vertical farming, which seems to be developing pretty uh, successfully? Yes, so I think the potential there, um, there's two folds. One is a lot of these places that do the vertical farming or the controlled environment agriculture require a lot of energy. Um, the ones, not the vertical farms, but the controlled agriculture, because they're fighting the greenhouse effect because they're greenhouses, require a lot of cooling. And so this could be a renewable energy source for that cooling. But even the vertical farms, which utilize a lot of LED lights, which are way, way um, lower in terms of energy users, still require energy. And this is not only a way on gridded installations to offset that carbon footprint, but a way to come back to the nutrition point that I think Paula brought up, a way to bring off-grid nutrition to places. So there is certainly a possibility for that integration. And then I, I just, on a personal note, I don't know if you can see this photo. Yes. Uh, this is farming at 6,000 feet in Colorado. You see the panels there, would it pay to have me raise those up and extend the gardens out of there, or is that a little going too far? Well, it, how tall are the panels? They look pretty tall as it is. Well, they're only about three feet off the ground at the low point. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the ones we have are six feet. In, in Colorado, we just pushed for six feet instead of like three or four um, because things grow so well and so fast up there that otherwise you would shade out the panels. Um, so the other part is depending on the spacing, you could kind of ins insert farming back in between those panels in a way that doesn't shade the farm. Um, so this is a project we're doing up in Coolidge with a solar company is what kind of farming and dry land farming can we bring to existing solar installations that doesn't get in the way of those low trackers. 
we just have to be intentional about what kind of crops you grow there, but I bet you could, you could still work with what you have. Which part of Colorado? Or maybe I'll ask you afterwards. Uh, Montrose area. Okay. Yeah, everything we're doing is in Longmont, um, Denver area, Fort Collins. So certainly possible. I'm surprised that um, Germany is an option for this because they have considerably less sunlight, um, particularly in winter. Uh, mm -hmm. is, do you still have enough available yeah, sunlight to, to allow this to work in those circumstances? Yeah. Let's see. Gisela is not I'm muted. I'm going to mute you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So part of the reason it works in, or they're trying it in Germany, is that Germany is so pro-solar. There's so much solar installed in Germany that they are, they've not maxed out the rooftops, but there's tons of rooftop coverage. And so they're always at that cutting edge. The other thing is, think about if you had an umbrella and you're close to the ground and you huddle underneath it, your shade profile is pretty low. It's a pretty small area. But as you raise that umbrella, you get more, you get less of a shade effect and that footprint grows out. You can imagine that kind of exercise. And so what they do in Germany oftentimes is raise their solar panels like 15, 20 feet up in the air. Um, and so it's a completely different type of practice, but that's how they're going about it there. So it looks different, but it's for different reasons. It's well, I'll ask the best it's, questions. It's exciting that it's spreading so far around the world in countries where you, like Germany, where you wouldn't expect it. Very exciting. Um, so what's next for you and for the research? Yeah, good question. So it kind of varies depending on the day, um, but you know, in terms of large solar, we're thinking about ways of bringing food production to um, solar producers in a way that's kind of low touch, low energy, I mean, low person hours, low water. And so what kind of perennial crops can solar producers allow on their lands that will, you know, allow for just something better? Um, on some levels, we're working with some of the social scientists uh, in our department to talk to farmers and energy producers about what some of their hesitations are. Because as we know, you can have all of the clearest facts and it still doesn't influence decision making sometimes. And so we want to get, you know, get some insights from folks. You know, what, given what we've said, what are some hesitations you still have? Sometimes those drive the next iteration of research questions that we do. And in terms of the physical science measurements, we're constantly building out our portfolio of the plants that we've measured. So right now, Waiuli is a big crop in Pinal County, this rubber replacement plant. How well does that work? There's literally no information, literally nobody can tell you. So part of our work being, you know, a public university land grant place is doing that research to help decision makers. And so we want to find that, find that out. And so we're working on that. So it's constantly evolving. That would be an interesting combination of producing energy and producing plant to make rubber at the yeah. same time. That would be, that would be pretty cool. Yeah. I, I want to interject that people may, people are probably still going to have some questions, but I wanted to respond to a comment from Gladys. This, the recording will get put up after a few days of doing some editing on the, um, Sustainable Tucson YouTube channel, and there will be a link on our website uh, with the announcement of this uh, so that people will be able to find it. And if you have friends who were interested or you think should be interested, you could point them to that and they'll be able to watch the recording. That'll be up. So. Great. Well, I included a link to our website that points to 
It's just the solarfarm.org. Um, wow. But there you can also find a few, you know, popular press type articles about the project and a few videos about the project. So you don't have to read the nerdy science papers if you don't want to. There, someone, and I'm not sure what the organization was. It, I wasn't familiar with it, but someone today posted an article about your work and uh, what's going on at Tumamak with the Resilience Garden and mm. Ajo CSA. Um, so that's on the uh, Sustainable Tucson Facebook page and a variety of other places that oh, I cool. posted. Uh, it, it, it fits very nicely, I think, into the, the interest now in indigenous um, techniques and as well as the needs, like you talked about, uh, mm -hmm. what the possibilities would be for um, using this on Tona Odom. Yes. I mean, people have been living here for 4,000 plus years, right? And growing food and surviving through all the climate variability. And so what lessons can we learn from their practices? One of them is growing the food, their food production in shade. Uh, we had a, a undergraduate student working with us summer before last. She was from the Pueblo Nation in south of Albuquerque. And she immediately, she's like, ah, this is just like my grandfather. He grows our vegetables under the mesquite tree. You know, it is very similar practices, but um, the, the shade is renewable energy because of that additional need that, that we have. And so it's building on, you know, lots of different sources of knowledge. I have a question for Kirsten. The answer may be no or I don't know, uh, but the, um, this federal infrastructure grant or package that was passed has money for um, resiliency and energy production and stuff. Do you have any idea whether this is something that we might uh, look to part for possible funding for experiments? Teresa, that's a great question. I do not know the answer. I would be overjoyed if it was possible. Well, I, I'm trying to find I don't out well. about that, so. Oh, I can jump in if oh. that's okay. <laughs> um, it's a, really a delight to listen in. I. Uh, I heard about agrivoltaics probably three years ago, and I have been trying to learn as much as possible. So Kirsten's been wonderful. Um, but I have done a lot of chatting at the state level. And every time I bring it up in a room um, where I can talk to folks who are in agriculture, folks who are dealing with water, um, in the last three months, they have pointed back to exactly what you've just said. We've got this money and now might be the time to start working on this. And so Kirsten has been trying to close the loop with us and Greg to see, you know, truly if this is the time to start moving forward with some of this, um, with some test, um, some, what do they call it? The test pilot, a pilot program here within the state. But I, I certainly, every chance I get, I'm, I'm chirping about this and trying to, uh, you know, get energy and excitement behind it. And I think we're getting there. Great. Right. Stephanie is on the Natural Resources Committee in the Senate now. Oh, excellent. So. Excellent. Excellent. Shirley, you want to ask your question? It's not exactly related to growing crops in the shade, but I've seen articles on um, experiments in growing crops with brackish water and some of them have been as a result of desalination um, processes where you don't get clear drinking water but you get brackish water any comments i was just commenting with the mute on <laughs> um still two years later um yes you're absolutely right part of what we're doing with the the group in Israel is they are utilizing that power for off-grid desalinization um, of some of that 
super, super brackish water so that it can be usable for crop production. Similarly with um, our collaborator, Carletta Chief, um, who's also at the University of Arizona, she's um, looking at projects that we could do on the Diné land Navajo Nation where they have other contaminated water issues. And so right now they have a, a trailer, a mobile unit that is solar powered for water purification. And what we're talking about here is can we create a system where you're also utilizing that shade for food production and just adding one more beneficial level to it. But you're exactly right. Using that power for something good for the water aspect of this. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and there's another aspect to that that I've always wondered about and can't seem to find anybody who knows the answer. Maybe you do. There's so much open land on the reservation. And most importantly, the long lines from the former page area, the, the uh, coal fired power plant, the long lines are there. Wouldn't it make sense to build photovoltaics on the reservation and all that open land combined with brackish water and photo agriculture? Um, it, it just seems to me a, a mix that would work nicely. Have, have you had any? any uh, knowledge of that potential? Because they could just tie the production right into the existing long lines. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say the short answer is yes, I think so. The longer answer is, you know, making sure we're listening to the, the needs and wishes of the people. Um, I know that because I've been hearing from other solar companies that they're anxious to get in on all of that open land. Um, on the Navajo Nation because they see those transmission lines, they see beautiful open sun skies um, and little obstruction. And so when different solar companies have asked us if we'd partner with them proposing a project, just been really hesitant to be connected to the wrong train because you're not always sure about their intentions. But I can tell you that we've been talking with a guy, he, his name is Tony. Tony Scalias, he's at Navajo Power. And we've been, we've been talking with him about this. And the other part is making sure we build a relationship over time so that we're constantly talking through, you know, his questions, his concerns. We go back, see what we can find out and bring it back. But I think quite a few people who are decision makers on the Navajo Nation agree that not only do they need a clean source of energy now, but that clean source of energy could help drive some of the irrigation um, that they want to be able to do and have the water rights to do um, because they want to put in more wells and this could be a way of operating those. Um, so I think, yes, Charles, you're absolutely spot on there. It's just one of those things where we're talking with a population that's been burned multiple times before. And so we're walking very carefully with them through the, through the process, but I agree that I don't see any physical science reason that it would not be working there. And that's part of when I added that comment about like, could non-arable lands suddenly be more arable because we brought solar and solar powered um, water purification to some of these places. I'm very hopeful. And I would like to say that, you know, in five years, we could show you something. I'm just gonna say, Paula, uh, when we you first asked me, I had to make sure that I could make this work. And now I'm looking forward to watching the recording, not to hear my dog go crazy, <laughs> but to be able to like, recapture all of the thoughts and questions that the community has put together because, wow, what a thoughtful group. So Great. thank you. Well, it, you've touched on so many areas that we're very much interested in and and I think have given all of us a lot of new and additional ideas of ways to combine combine some of those interests in very productive ways. 